Hello everybody, I am Dhawal Singh, a third year undergraduate in the Mathematics Department and today I will be presenting the proof of the transcendence of E over Q. I would like to thank Professor Ronnie Sebastian for suggesting this topic and for several useful suggestions to improve the presentation. So let us start uh, by defining the polynomial g of x which is equal to x minus 1, x minus 2 all the way up to x minus n. right? And uh, as you can see, if we expand it, then uh, g of x will be equal to x raised to n. So it's going to be a monic polynomial of degree n. And plus it will have coefficients. Let us call them ai's. And as you can see, the last coefficient will be m my 1 into 2 into 3 all the way up to n with a minus 1 or plus 1 sign depending upon whether n is odd or n is even. So uh, since 1 to n all are integers, what we can say is that all ai's belong to z, correct? And now let us look at, let us look at g of x raised to p. Now and uh, let us just say that where p is a prime. So when we expand g of x raised to p, what we get is that of course we will use our very good friend binomial uh, theorem and then we will get x raised to n p plus let's say b n p minus 1 into x raised to n p minus 1 all the way up to now what will happen to the final coefficient is that it will be n factorial p types and minus 1 will be raised to n p again because of the sign that we had already seen so what we get now is that b i's also belong to z why again because binomial coefficients are all integral and the coefficients a i's were integral and b i's are just binomial coefficient into a i's so we get g of x raised to p as x raised to n p plus b n p minus 1 x raised to n p minus 1 all the way up to minus 1 raised to n p into n factorial raised to p so now let us look at x raised to p minus 1 times gx of p right and this polynomial will be x and p plus p minus 1 plus b and p minus 1 into x and p plus p minus 2 all the way up to minus 1 raised to np into n factorial raised to p times x raised to p minus 1 so if you look at this polynomial what you can see is that it's coefficients are integral are integers and its powers go from x raised to p minus 1 to x raised to n p plus p minus 1 now consider the integral consider the integral 0 to infinity x raised to p minus 1 times g of x raised to p times e raised to minus x divided by p, p minus 1 factorial dx. Now it is possible that you might ask what is the motivation behind this and very soon we will see that how you know these polynomials or these integrals are related to proving transcendence of e but first let us try to look at some interesting properties of this integral. So I will write it a little nicely as 1 minus p minus 1 factorial 0 to infinity. Now what I can do is again since I knew the polynomial I have defined it over here. I can just write it in an expanded version. So e raised to minus x times x raised to n p plus p minus 1 plus b n p minus 1 times x raised to n p plus p minus 2 dot 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 all the way up to minus 1 raised to n p into n factorial raised to p into x raised to p minus 1 dx right now we know that this integral x raised to m and z raised to minus x dx is m factorial uh, this comes from our good old friend gamma function so now what happens to this integral is it becomes 1 
by p minus 1 factorial and then as you can see this thing will become n p plus p minus 1 factorial then this term will become b n p minus 1 times n p plus p minus 2 factorial all the way up to this will give p minus 1 factorial so let me write it properly we get n p plus p minus 1 factorial plus b n p minus 1 times n p plus p minus 2 factorial plus all the way up to minus 1 raised to n p and factorial raised to p times p minus 1 factorial right and uh, since all the bi's are integers and so bi's belong to z and p divides p factorial divided by p minus 1 factorial p plus 1 factorial divided by p minus 1 factorial all the way up to n p plus p minus 1 factorial divided by p minus 1 factorial as this term is just p this term is p into p plus 1 so as we can see p will div divide all these subsequent terms so now let us define let us define m n p to be equal to 0 to infinity integral x is to p minus 1 times g f x is to p times e raised to minus x divided by p minus 1 factorial just an integral we are just trying to give it a name for notational purposes and so now what we get is therefore m n p will be equal to so all the terms before this will give some integer n times p because they divide p plus as you can see what happens with this term is that p minus 1 factorial and p minus 1 factorial gets cancelled and we get right so we get this term over here right n factorial raised to p <laughs> now if p is greater than n and since p is prime p does not divide n because p is a prime so you know it will only divide uh, any integer which has p in its prime factorization and n can never have p in its prime factorization and since p is also a prime it will also not divide n and all the numbers be before it so n n minus 1 and so so p does not divide n factorial interestingly we get p does not divide n factorial raised to p that is and thus this is the most one of the most important observation that p does not divide m of np p will not divide m of np because again uh, this part this part is divisible by p and this part is not divisible by p so this is our first important observation that if p is a prime and p greater than n then m n p is an integer and p does not divide m n p this will be our first observation that we will use in our proof for transcendence of e so let me just put it in a box now let us move on now we can write e raised to t as e raised to t times m n p divided by m n p nothing special there uh, just to make a remark t belongs to positive integers right because yeah so as m n p is an integer I'm so sorry as m n p is an integral it is also an integer but it is an integral we can split it into limits 0 to t and t to infinity now this is one of the crucial steps so we will write this as e raised to t 
and we will just break the integral so 0 to t x is to p minus 1 g of x raised to p into e raised to minus x dx by p minus 1 factorial plus t to infinity x is to p minus 1 into g of x is to p into e raised to minus x dx divided by p minus 1 factorial and this thing is of course divided by mnp which is also in the numerator now again for the uh, notational convenience we call epsilon subscript t of np to be e raised to t times 0 to t x is to p minus 1 into g of x is to p into e raised to minus x dx by p minus 1 factorial and we call mt of np to be e raised to t integral t to infinity x to p minus 1 into g of x raised to p into e raised to minus x dx divided by p minus 1 factorial and so we can write e raised to t as just the sum of these two so epsilon t of np plus mt of np divided by m of np right and now as we can see some places e is coming e raised to t is coming it does seem to look like look like we are trying to go somewhere near the transcendence you know of e so now we will analyze epsilon t of np and mt of np and get two more important results before we can finally trying to you know finally try to reach the point where we prove that e is transcendental over q so now let us look at mt of np what is this this is e raised to t times t to infinity x is to p minus 1 into g of x is to p times e raised to minus x dx divided by p minus 1 factorial now this looks very similar to what we had done with mnp and that is what we will trying to do we will sub let us substitute y equal to x minus t the motivation behind this is to get the limits to 0 to infinity and see if we find something familiar so mt of np can now be written as you can see if you substitute y as x minus t the limits will become 0 to infinity and since y is x minus t x is y plus t so everywhere we see x we will just put y plus t into also here we get e raised to minus y times e raised to minus t dy divided by p minus 1 factorial and as we can see this e minus t and e plus t will get cancelled so we get this looking integral now let us assume that t is greater than 0 and less than n and we already know that recall that recall that t is an integer right so now what do we get we get g of y plus t so let us try to see what g was g was just our polynomial g was x minus 1 x minus 2 all the way up to x minus n now we just have to put x as y plus t so we will get y plus t minus 1 y plus 2 t minus 2 all the way up to so let us look at what is interesting about this so we get y plus t minus 1 y plus t minus 2 and this is where our assumption comes into play since t is an integer between 0 and n if we grow, go from 1 to all the way up to n there will be a point where we will reach t and that term will become y plus t minus t which is just y and this is going to be very important further we will see y into all the way up to y plus t minus n right so writing it a little bit neatly we will get g of y plus t now also note that t is an integer 1 up to n is n is an integer so when you multiply this you will also get an integer so let us just write this y outside 
and since there were n terms now there will be n minus 1 terms because one y has come out so you will get a polynomial in y with the highest power being y raised to n minus 1 with coefficient 1 and then you will get d n minus 2 y raised to n minus 2 all the way up to d1 y plus d0 and it is easy to check that d0 belong to oh sorry d i's belong to z correct because again t and all of these things are integer and just like we did for g of x this is what we get so now let us look at because we want eventually the integral that is above now let us look at g of y plus y plus t is to p times y plus t is to p minus 1 so we will get y raised to p and then again our friend binomial coefficient will come let us just write this properly once raised to p times y plus t raised to p minus 1 so now we will expand both using the binomial theorem we will get y raised to p times y raised to n minus 1 times p plus now i am just writing these coefficients as stars why because all of the what we care about is that the uh, they are integral coefficients all of these are integers again because di's are integers and the binomial coefficients you know pc1 pc2 all of these are integers so this part will also be an integer so let we we'll just call it star and here also the highest coefficient will be y raised to p plus 1 plus star times y raised to p minus 2 all the way up to t raised to p minus 1 right okay so again simplifying it further and multiplying these two brackets again very similar so we get y raised to p minus 1 and now the highest power will be n p minus p plus p minus 1 so it will be y raised to n p minus 1 plus star times y raised to n p minus 2 all the way up to you know this d naught raised to p and t raised to p minus 1 we will again call it this star okay so therefore therefore we can write g of y plus t raised to p times y plus t raised to p minus 1 again we will just multiply with this y also we will get y raised to n p plus p minus 1 plus star times y raised to n p plus p minus 2 all the way up to star times y raised to p an important observation to make here is that the powers go from y raised to p to y raised to n p plus p minus 1 and now we can already see that when we put it into the integral the last term that we were getting as p minus 1 factorial this time will just be p factorial and so m thus m t of n p which is equal to 0 to infinity raised to minus y g of y plus t is to p times y plus t is to p minus 1 dy divided by p minus 1 factorial let us write this a little neatly will be 1 p minus 1 factorial 0 to infinity e is to minus y and then we will just substitute the polynomial y raised to n p plus p minus 1 plus star times y raised to n p plus p minus 2 all the way up to star times y raised to p dy divided by p minus 1 factorial oh no p minus 1 factorial is already answered very nice so now recall integral 0 to infinity y raised to m into e raised to minus y dy is again m factorial and so what we get is mt of np will be np plus p minus 1 factorial divided by p minus 1 factorial plus star times n p plus p minus 2 factorial divided by p minus 1 factorial all the way up to p factorial divided by p minus 1 factorial of course there is a star coefficient here which is an integer now 
वी ऑब्जर्व p divides p factorial by p minus 1 factorial and also you know all the way up to n p plus p minus 1 factorial by p minus 1 factorial and as stars are integers we get mt of np is an integer and p divides mt of np and this is our second observation so our second observation is that if t is an integer and t between 0 and n then mt of np is an integer divisible by this is a second observation let us just take some time to look at it just going back with the idea is that uh, we tried to just change the limits and then did a similar uh, analysis like the one we had done with mnp and here the only difference is that since the coefficient start from p we get that p factorial by p minus 1 factorial which is just p which is divisible by p and so all the subsequent terms are also divisible by p and mt of np is divisible by p great now what is left epsilon now let us look at epsilon t of np and which was what 0 to t x is to p minus 1 g of x is to p into e raised to minus x dx by p minus 1 factorial so we will look at just the mod of epsilon of which will be the mod of the entire integral good job now this is less than again of course just using the inequality on the moduli g of x into e raised to minus x mod dx divided by p minus 1 factorial now for t less than n x of course belongs in the limits of the integral so it belongs to 0 to t we have x raised to p minus 1 is of course less than n raised to p minus 1 because x is less than t and t is subsequently less than n so x raised to p minus 1 is less than n raised to p minus 1 so we get epsilon t of np is less than epsilon t raised to into and the integral g of x is to p mod into e raised to minus x mod dx divided by p minus 1 factorial notice that for t less than n e raised to t is of course less than e raised to n or let's just say mod of e raised to t although e is always positive right and and e raised to minus x the mod is less than 1 why because x belongs to 0 to t and e raised to minus x is a decreasing function and e raised to 0 is 1 so it is always so we can always just write this so if we get epsilon t of np mod is less than e raised to n into n raised to p minus 1 times 0 to t g of x we will write p minus 1 factorial outside because it does not depend on x mod dx e raised to minus x is just less than 1 so we can just remove that now recall that recall g of x mod 
is mod of x minus 1, x minus 2, all the way up to x minus n. And for x in 0 to t, t less than n, x minus 1 mod is less than n, all the way up to x minus n is less than n. And so, g of x mod is less than n raised to n because each term n terms are less than n so n raised to n and g of x raised to p mod is than n raised to n p and so therefore epsilon t of n p is less than epsilon sorry e raised to n times n raised to p minus 1 times n raised to n p divided by p minus 1 factorial 0 to t dx this will be t which is less than n so this will be less than epsilon n into n raised to p minus 1 into n raised to n p times n divided by p minus 1 factorial so finally we get finally therefore epsilon t of n p is less than e raised to n times n raised to n plus 1 p divided by p minus 1 factorial and now let us just call this a of n p right now note that note that a of n p is independent of t is independent of t now what does that mean is that for any value of t this is always an upper bound right now also note that a of n p tends to 0 as p tends to infinity right so now if beta 1, beta 2, all the way up to beta n are integers, then summation i equal to 1 to n, beta i epsilon i of n p will be less than summation i equal to 1 to n, beta i a of n p, right? But now a of np is independent of i, so we can just, so this is less than summation i equal to 1 to n, beta i times mod of a n p, again a n p is positive, and mod of beta i, which is less than a n p times beta i, this is a finite summation, so it does not matter, clearly rhs tends to 0 as p tends to infinity as a of n p tends to 0 and hence comes our third observation. So our third observation is that summation i equal to 1 to n beta i epsilon i of n p tends to 0 as p tends to infinity. Very nice. So now we have gotten the three important observations that will help us with the proof. Just so let me add a new page. So I will just state the first two observations. Observation number one was that if p is a prime and p greater than n then m of n p is an integer and p does not divide m of n p this was our first observation and what was our second observation our second observation our second observation was that if t between 0 and n and 
t is an integer then mt of np is an integer divisible by p so these are the three important observations that you know you might just call them lemmas because they are very important for what we are going to do and now we can finally move to trying to show that e is transcendental so these were required and we will see why they were required and then we will also discuss the idea behind why so hope that this is clear and now we can move to transcendence of i'll just add another page yeah so now we show e is transcendental over q if not let e be algebraic over q what is the definition of an algebraic uh, of a number being algebraic is that therefore there is there is a polynomial belonging to qx such that f of e is equal to 0 now clearing denominators we may assume f of x belongs to set x why because we can just assume the uh, coefficient to be integral if not then we will just take the lcm of the denominators of all the rational coefficients multiply with it and then what we will finally get is something that is in zx thus we have c0 plus c1 x plus all the way up to cl x raised to l has e as a root therefore c0 also ci is belong to z and c0 and cl not equal to 0 so c0 plus c1e plus all the way up to cl e raised to l is equal to 0 let us just call this equation i right and now we can also see powers of e e raised to t appearing already in this equation and that is how we are going to proceed with the proof so now let n greater than l be an integer now recall that recall that e raised to t is mt of np plus epsilon t of np divisible by m np therefore for t belongs to z and 0 less than t less than n we put this into i to get so what was i i is this equation that is visible and we will just put every e just substituting their power right so this is the equation i just in case so we will get c0 plus c1 times now for e t is 1 so we will get m1 of np plus epsilon 1 of np divided by m np for c2 it will just become m2 and plus all the way up to cl times ml of np plus epsilon l of np divided by m n p equal to 0 now m n p is non zero why because it was not divisible by p and zero is divisible by p so for a large enough p m n p will always be non zero so we can cross multiply by m n p right so we get this will be c zero 
टाइम्स एम एन पी प्लस सी वन टाइम्स एम वन एम पी प्लस एप्सिलन वन एम पी ऑल द वे अप टू सी एल टाइम्स एम एल एन पी प्लस एप्सिलन एल एन पी इज इक्वल टू जीरो वेरी गुड जस्ट राइटिंग इट अ लिटिल प्रॉपरली जस्ट कलेक्टिंग दी एम एल्स एंड एप्सिलन एल्स टूगेदर वी गेट सी जीरो टाइम्स एम एन पी प्लस समेशन आई इक्वल टू वन टू एल सी आई एम आई एम एन पी प्लस आई इक्वल टू वन टू एल सी आई एप्सिलन आई एन पी इक्वल टू जीरो वी विल जस्ट मूव एप्सिलन आई टू द राइट हैंड साइड फॉर कन्वीनियंस equal to minus summation i equal to 1 to l ci epsilon i n p and i think that now we are almost done so paying close attention to this equation we can see that we can choose p to be greater than C zero and n. Thus, by point one, p we get p does not divide C zero times m n p. Since p is greater than C naught, of course, as we have already stated, that p cannot divide C naught, and for p greater than n. it can also not divide mnp let us just go back and see what the first point is this is the first point that if p is a prime and p greater than n then mnp is an integer and p does not divide mnp so p does not divide c not so this term is not divisible right also by point 2 we get p divides summation i equal to 1 to l ci mi n p why because for t less than n and greater than 0 and t being an integer this is what our point 2 was that t in integer mt of np is an integer divisible by p and so this entire thing is divisible by p so what we can conclude from here is that thus p does not divide lhs so let's say if we have 3 plus 2 and 2 divides 2 but 2 does not divide 3 then 2 will not divide 3 plus 2 this is an easy observation that that we can state and so p does not divide lhs thus LHS is a non-zero integer. As C I's are integers and M N P and M I N P are integers, it's an integer. And since P does not divide it, LHS is non-zero. Since P divides zero, and P does not divide LHS, so LHS is non-zero. On the other hand, on the other hand, by point. Three RHS tends to zero as p tends to infinity. Why? Let us go and look at what the point three was. Point three was that this was point three that this summation beta i epsilon i n p tends to zero as p tends to infinity. And that is exactly what we have on the RHS. C i's are integer. Their beta i was integer. and as we can see this is a contradiction as a non zero integer can never tend to zero never be equal to zero never be very small because it should be between 1 and minus this implies that e is not algebraic which implies e is 
just over q is very important is transcendental over q and this completes the proof this completes the proof the proof is based on three main ideas that let's just say that we proved but even if you did not understand the proof these are the three ideas that are required that p is a prime p is greater than n then m and p is an integer and that p does not divide m and p but with m i p or m t p m t of n p what happens is that because of that extra power p starts dividing it and that is also an integer and then we just use the basic definition of what an algebraic or a trans what it means to be algebraic over a field or transcendental over a field and then it just follows straight away that the contradiction is that a non negative non oh sorry a non zero number is equal to something which is very small almost zero thank you so much